Every single day, we make countless of decisions from the very moment that we wake up, the exact time that we decide to get out of bed, to the actual act of getting up from bed, to having breakfast and deciding what to eat, the actual act of eating, from us seeing people that we encounter, you know, perhaps later in our day, people we might have kinship with, people that we might embrace, that we might interact with, even the very act of walking, we are making decisions. Now, this might sound like second nature to you. I mean, you don't really think about it. Yet, neuroscientists can explain exactly what is happening in our brains as these decisions are happening. Neuroscientists can tell us exactly the parts of our brain that might activate when, let's say, we're hungry, when we're craving for certain things, the parts of our brain that might activate when we feel a want to connect with other people, to have an emotional connection, even to the motor functions of our body, the act of us moving, walking, going out there to grab food, the path that our nerve signals will travel throughout the body. All these things can explain the exact thing that we do at any given moment in a single day. And they're all happening here, different parts of our brain. But then here comes the problem. If we can explain exactly what happens in our brains and we can give a physical explanation of every single action that we take, then what exactly is the point of consciousness? If we know the different parts of our brain that fire up when we feel, let's say, hunger, when we feel all these things, and the different parts of our brain and nerve networks that activate when we do certain things, then what function does consciousness actually serve? Now, what's very interesting is actually anthropologist Thomas Huxley. The way he would posit this problem is to describe consciousness from this perspective as very much like a clock's chime. You know how if you had let's say, an alarm clock that chimed every hour, perhaps even a grandfather clock. The clock might be chiming, but the sound that it makes might have the least of any function compared to everything else that's actually going on to make the clock actually tell time. And perhaps our consciousness might just be the chime. It might not be doing anything truly significant at all. Even though we might feel that we are so special, that our consciousness is so integral, perhaps maybe not. Now, this problem really arises from this philosophical concept known as dualism and the problem of dualism. The idea that the mind and the body are two separate things. Take a moment to consider this. You might imagine the most grandiose thing in your mind. Perhaps you might imagine that you are actually, let's say, a cat or that you live in a castle on the moon. No matter what you might imagine up here, Reality is entirely different. The physical world, I mean, in most instances, be entirely different. No discount to you cat people out there. Or to put it another way, whatever you imagine in your mind, you are not able to actually touch it. All the things that are happening in the mind are happening in the mind. But with that being said, we also don't like the idea that our thoughts don't actually exist, that our mind does not exist. We like to believe that they do. So the key problem of dualism is really in understanding how something mental, something non-physical can possibly affect the physical world. And yet we clearly feel it happens. For example, when we want to have, let's say, a cookie, we might mentally think we want the cookie and somehow we will direct ourselves to go grab that cookie and perhaps eat it. But with that being said, we also know that a lot of times these things are actually happening involve various parts of our brains actually activating. For example, that part of our brain that may be hungry, that may signify hunger, may activate. And of course, other parts of the brain may activate that would direct us to try and seek out food. And of course, eventually the parts of our nerve networks that would guide us to actually conduct the action of grabbing a cookie, walking towards a cookie. In simple terms, the problem of dualism is not so easily resolved. We can already explain neuroscientifically what happens when we make these decisions every day, at least from a pure neuroscientific standpoint. But then what about consciousness, what function does it actually do? And this is why many philosophers have actually looked at it from a very interesting perspective known as epiphenomalism. The idea that although consciousness might not directly do anything at all, it exists as a summation of things. For example, some neuroscientists like Daniel DeHaan and other philosophers like Giello Tononi and Peter Godfrey Smith, they argue that consciousness can be best explained to exist as part of an integrated information theory. In this theory, consciousness arises from the sum of our cognitive processes, or as Tononi puts it, 
It is, in summary, the capacity of a system to integrate information. In other words, you can kind of think of consciousness, at least according to this theory, as the net product of all the things that we are doing, at least our mind, on a cognitive level, such as, for example, synchronizing sensory inputs and sensory information that we actually receive, accessing various types of memory that we might have, focusing on different aspects and so on and so forth. So according to this perspective, the mind, consciousness, is really an overseer of this intricate web of what's actually happening on a cognitive level. It is a byproduct and the result of all these complex cognitive things happening and it emerges out of this. When you integrate all the systems together, all the information together, what you have as a result is the conscious experience. In simpler terms, the mind emerges from its operations. This is an emergentist theory of how consciousness might actually exist and work. And although, if you think about it from this epiphenomenalist theory and perspective, that consciousness might be explained as really being this byproduct and therefore grounded in how our brains may actually work, it also poses some very serious questions, very troubling ones. Because although it seems to explain that the mind can exist and fully explained and accounted for by all these physical processes that we mentioned, it also seems to suggest that consciousness doesn't actually do anything at all. Now take a moment to really think about that. What does consciousness actually add to the equation that our sensory inputs, our smell, our sight, our interoception, our neuronal network has not already added? What does it actually even do? That all these other parts of our brain and the way that we were made physiologically is not already doing. By analogy, how we would explain this perplexing problem is almost like the concept of a traffic jam. Now, we all know what a traffic jam is. Of course, it's a situation when cars are congested on a road somewhere, and it's obviously very terrifying and very frustrating and terrible. But what does the concept of a traffic jam add to the equation that the cars, the vehicles, the trucks, the buses, the motorbikes are not already adding? The traffic jam only emerges as a concept. It adds nothing. Now, this is not to say that consciousness does not exist as we've already established. It does. It does exist. We might feel it is very special of an experience. It makes you you and it makes me me. However, if epiphenomenalism is actually true and correct, then it really seems to suggest that our consciousness doesn't actually do anything at all. And this is actually quite a terrifying reality or perhaps a very strange reality to most of us because what it would come to establish really is the idea that the most personal experience that we have, our consciousness, might not actually be adding anything to the physical world that is already ongoing. It means most of us are really just living in our head, at least in terms of our conscious experience. And all the thoughts and feelings might actually be pointless from that perspective of causality. In other words, and really a thought to leave ourselves with, it might suggest that we might be little kids in an autonomous car thinking that we're actually driving when in reality we're not. We're helpless in the direction of where the car is actually going, at least more helpless than we think we actually are. And so when you think about what's happening in your life and who you are, and you think you are really in control, how much control do you really have? And that's something to think about.